One X Play, you probably know them for their Windows gaming handheld PCs, right? But they do make mini PCs, and this is the M1. It looks a lot like their external eGPUs that they have, and this even does support one of those with Oculink. Now, the M1 is powered by the Intel Core Ultra 9 185H. It's Media Lake, it turbos at 1.5 gigahertz maximum, and it has 16 cores in total with it. It's got 32 gigabytes of RAM that you can configure it with, or 16, and this has two terabytes of storage, which is the highest spec that you can configure this to. And I'll be running through it in this video to let you know exactly what you can expect out of this nice, small, compact mini PC from One X Player. Okay, let's take a look at what we get with the M1. So we have a support card right here with all of their details. If you have any issues, of course, you just get in touch with them there, which is great. Here you will find instructions, a little leaflet that just goes over where all your ports are, what the ports actually do, and information about Windows wireless setup, whatnot. Pretty straightforward there. The M1 Mini PC, and this is a little tool here that they do include and then our charger. And what I like about this is that it's a Type-C charger, so you don't need to have uh, a DC barrel port, but you see it's just a Type-C plug, Type-C to Type-C there, and it's a 100 watt gun fast charger, so nice small compact size. Speaking of small and compact, this is a almost well pocketable mini PC here because it's just 196 by 120 by 32 millimeters. So only 32 millimeters thick and it weighs a respectable 615 grams. So quite a portable mini PC we have. So it does have the Intel Core Ultra 9 185H in this. I've got the top spec with the 32 gigabytes of RAM and two terabytes of SSD storage. This is our cooling vent here and it's got some pretty good cooling to be able to handle the default 45 watts, but also the turbo mode, which is then 60 watts. And I can see a little mesh in there for dust filtering, which is a good idea. So we have HDMI, and this is HDMI 2.0, so 60 hertz both of these, because it doesn't state that it's any higher. So it's not HDMI 2.1. However, we've got the two USB 4 ports if you needed to run 4K 144 hertz or 4K 120. And here we do have two buttons. So one is for our RGB to cycle that, and that's the turbo button, fingerprint, reader, and power button status LED. And you see on the back here, so we've got two USB type A's. These are USB 3.2 Gen 1, a micro SD card reader, gigabit LAN, I believe. They don't actually state the speeds, but if I have it, I'll put it on the screen now for you. Audio. 3.5 millimeter, we've got DisplayPort then, and that is DisplayPort 1.4a, another HDMI, which is uh, the same as before, so it's 4K60 only, HDMI 2.0, and then two Type-C ports, which are USB 4.0. Now, one of these, of course, you're going to have always plugged in with your power, so you're gonna lose one, unless you use a hub, maybe is another alternative for that, which, of course, you have that possibility. On the back here, we have our SSD hatch and two rubber feet that it does sit on. And as you can see already, the matte black is, yes, picking up fingerprints, but normally you wouldn't be handling it like I am right now, of course. So this SSD hatch, you don't need any screws or anything. It's just got magnets holding in this little metal plate there. And there's no thermal pad on the other side of this, but you could probably add that yourself. And there is our PCIe 4.0 SSD. So 2280 millimeter is the size of that one. Looks like they could have had room here maybe to put in a smaller size uh, SSD, but no, we don't have that. And there's just a little plug right there. On the right is where the exit vent is. So the cool air sucked in here, blowing out the back right there. Does get hot in this area. It's kind of normal seeing how thin it is. And you can see some of that RGB. Now, if you press the RGB button, which I'll do now, you can then cycle through different modes of it. So you can either have it strobe like flashing there, different colors or continual color if you want to. So I can just now have it all red, which does look nice. It's a nice little added touch, especially at nighttime. 
And under that little hatch there, you're probably wondering what was there? What was that all about? Well, this is our Oculink port. So it's really good to see this on here because that supports 63 gigabits per second in theory. And that's a lot more than the 40 you get over Thunderbolt 4 or USB 4. So good option to have that on a mini PC if you wanted to use an external GPU. You can use their one, the One X Player external GPU they've got, or your own dock setup and use that. Now I wanted to show you the internals, but I have come this far from removing some screws on the bottom. There are four here, another two here, but I can't slot the internal part out of this um, outer metal shell here. It just won't let me, and I think I may need to use a pry tool or something on the back of it. I don't want to risk damaging this, so I'm just going to leave it as is. Maybe some other reviewers have had a bit more luck than me gaining access to the internals, but there's no real need for us to go there because the RAM sold it on board, you can't upgrade it. The wireless card's also sold it on, and we just got access to the SSD right here. So that's really all we can upgrade. So no need to really pull the whole thing apart unless it becomes choked up with dust. However, we do have that filter that I showed you here, the dust filter, so that shouldn't even happen either. So unfortunately, yeah, can't show you the internals here. With the BIOS, there's not a lot to show you. That we only have really one thing we can change, and that is a power limit one. But we've got the turbo button, so you can switch between 45 and 60. So maybe if you wanted to lower the power limit, you could put it in there. You've got your typical security, boot order, and other settings, but really not a lot, nothing we can tweak. That's it. Here we are in Windows now. So just wanted to correct you on something, an error that I did make. I said it didn't have upgradable RAM. Well, it does. It does have two sticks of DDR5 and you can change those somehow if you figure out how to open it up, which I could not. A little bit of that RAM is assigned to the Intel Arc graphics and this chipset, as I mentioned at the start there, it's the Core Ultra 9 185H. So it's 5.1 gigahertz maximum turbo. It does have 16 cores, 22 threads. It's got a bit of power and I'm running it right now at the 60 watts. So the maximum performance for all of these benchmarks and tests that I'm about to show you. So the single core score here, I've seen a little bit better than this. So have I with the multi-core score, but still very good. I mean, Look at the multi-core score here. This is bettering a Threadripper, the 1950, and that's a huge chipset, and it's able to better that, which is um, pretty impressive considering how small it is, but of course, it's old now. It is a little bit dated, and when we take a look at other benchmarks here, so to start out with our integrated graphics, again, the, the Arc graphics that it has into our Arc graphics score, that is 30,000. Now, I have seen a bit better and considering we are running 60 watts here, I was hoping for better scores, perhaps even class leading scores for this particular chipset, but we're not seeing it. And why is that? Well, it does get a little bit hot, maybe a bit of throttling's coming into play there. And the graphics score here of Time Spy of 3200 is definitely not the best I have seen for Intel Arc graphics. I've seen scores that are nearing towards the 4000, 3,800, 3,700, and I did expect to see a little bit better out of that uh, chipset. Finally, Geekbench 6.3. Very good scores, but yes, you knew I was gonna say that. Not the best I've seen for this particular chipset. I have seen a bit higher there. So all up, it's a very powerful little unit. Everything is quick and snappy. I'm not experiencing any issues and even multitasking. It's all great. There's no problem. So the built-in software here that you get from One X Player, you'll find this, which is very similar to their handhelds. So if you've got one of their PC handheld gaming consoles, then this all rings a bell. It's the same layout and everything. They've basically just used the same software. So we have a fan mode that you can adjust. I keep it on automatic, but you can force it to preset one or preset two, and it can control the TDP, which is our power limit. And as mentioned, I've set it to 60 because I want to see exactly what this can do, the top performance. You have a turbo on key. You can press the turbo button to on the outside that is going to control the 45 and 60 watt toggle. And you can adjust here the display and even a performance overlay if you wish, which is rather handy and does have this, which is memory. So you can reduce the memory usage. You can basically clear the memory 
Uh, you don't normally need to do this because Windows will handle it, but if you want, you're running a bit low, tap it, and you see it pops up and tells you the result that it has cleared a bit of memory there. So other things to point out, internal storage, two terabytes, I have the maximum spec here, decent speeds, but if it's PCI 4.0, which it's meant to be, actually quite poor because we could see 7,000 sequential reads and writes and the randoms could be a little bit higher there. So it's not a class leading PCIe 4.0 SSD that they have chosen, chosen and used in here, which is a shame, but you can easily upgrade that if you wanted to do so. Wireless, so I've had no problems. Good signal strength, despite it having, of course, that metal housing on it. I thought it might affect it, but it hasn't, which is really good to see. And then playback with a uh, very demanding file, so 4K. Let's take a look at this one. This is the Sony Swordsmith. It's 4K 60, well, a few stutters just then. Could be to do with the overlay with a video player. Now that that's gone, it looks like that is definitely now 60 frames per second and looking smooth. So it's a demanding file there. Even worse is this 10 bit, 140 megabits per second. Again, all the decoding, oh, bit of stutter, bit more and more stutter. Okay, so video playback could be a bit better there. It's not amazing. And I often do see this for some reason with Intel's uh, Arc, you can get that in some systems. It doesn't happen. It's very odd. Not too sure what the cause of that is. All right, so here we are now in YouTube and I want to test out VP9 codec performance. You can see it's using the VP9 codec and I want it to set it to 10, 4K. Here we are on YouTube having a look at the 4K decoding performance using the VP9 codec, which I can see clearly it is using under codecs there. This video always seems to use it. And let's take a look full screen now. And for some reason the controls didn't disappear. All right, so the buffer health is good around six seconds. In fact, 10 now on the Wi-Fi working well. We're getting any drop frames? No, no drop frames at all. Just in the beginning now. So it has been stuck at 37 and that's it. And you can see that this is incredibly smooth. Although maybe my video capture is not showing it to be incredibly smooth, but it is, trust me, it's not dropping any frames. So that's great. So you can edit 4K video on this particular uh, mini PC. It's not too bad if it's a basic 4K edit. You don't go crazy with grading, transitions and other fancy effects. So this is Adobe Premiere Pro, the latest version, and the playback is smooth, and it does seem to be running about, although it's showing me 10 frames per second, I can see clearly that it's about the 30 that it should be, which is fine. Skipping ahead in the timeline is all good. Now, because uh, it's just integrated graphics, I will only be testing an export of just a minute of footage at the YouTube preset. Let's uh, take a look and see how long it takes. It should be around about 30 seconds or under start on the timer and export. So there is a second between me doing that. And then this is just steaming through it. Look at this very quick. And I did expect it to be quite fast. Should finish up in under 30 seconds, around about 24 seconds, I think is the record so far for Intel Arc Graphics. But we'll see what it gets. And you can see it's the Arc Graphics doing pretty much all of the work there. Well, CPU is at only 30% and that's at 90. All right, 35 seconds, a little bit slower than I was expecting. And if you factor in that delay that I had here, yeah, maybe about 34 there. Gaming right now with Cyberpunk, and this is at 1080p lowest preset, and I'm not doing too well. I think I'm about to die here, but 30 frames per second with a lot of action at the moment. I've got some guys chasing me, trying to kill me. And I don't think that's too bad for 1080p low preset for such a demanding game. However, let's check out and see what 720p is like. All right, much better. You want to play the game at 720p because I now have 49 frames per second and it just crashed about 50. So that is a big improvement in the frame rate and for integrated graphics, as I just said before, I mean, this is pretty good. This is not bad for such a demanding game. You've got to bear that in mind. This is not an easy game for integrated graphics to render and get this kind of frame rate. The Witcher 3, this is running at an expected mid 40s 
for our frame rate. And that's even with a bit of action there, me just slicing and dicing a few bandits there. So it's okay, and I can see that it's hitting the 2.1, 2.2 turbo limit area here for the ARC graphics, whereas with Cyberpunk, a lot of the time it was at 1.2, wasn't it? It was 1.2, 1.4, kind of bounces around. It's doing the same here. So it's not holding the maximum turbos on the ARC graphics. The wattage is also reflecting that because it's only 35 watts, 30. Even though I have it set to the 60 watt limit, it seems the ARC graphics just doesn't want to go there, even though we're at just 71. 74 degrees Celsius at the moment. Does it thermal throttle? Well, let's have a look. Yes, okay, you see the red here with HW info. Thermal throttling did take place. So this explains why I've seen the performance dipping down a little bit. The cooler, well, it's doing a good job and the outside of it doesn't get crazy hot or anything when I touch it. There's throttling, so those clocks are being lowered, lowering the performance, lowering the GPU performance, CPU performance there. And this explains why the Time Spy score, 3D Mark, the other score, Cinebench, and even Geekbench was a little bit lower than what I've seen that this chipset could potentially do. So it did spike at 101 degrees Celsius. That is on our chipset there, the Core Ultra 9185H. And I think I even saw, yes, on the CPU package, 103 degrees Celsius. So it does spike at that but when the fan kicks in we get um, the fan profile in the top performance mode where it gets its loudest those temperatures do drop down into the mid 70s so it's just for a few seconds it will throttle but that's enough to affect things like synthetic benchmarks quite a lot now the good news is here that if you want to run linux i'm testing out linux manjaro here with the open source drivers it does run fine you can see this is my youtube channel here in Firefox, so the web browser that comes with it. Wireless works, Bluetooth works, audio works, everything so far does seem to work just fine. So Linux gets a thumbs up for support. Then the fan noise of the mini PC, what is it like? Well, it sounds very similar to a gaming laptop when it is gaming, when you're editing video and it's being pushed very hard. The fan noise is constant and it does lower down to a low RPM. Now with the software included, you can adjust the power limit and you can even tweak and set those presets for the fan. At lower power limits, you're gonna hear that fan a lot less and it won't be very loud then if you need it to be a little bit quieter. If you're just browsing the web or watching videos, then I do recommend you just lower that power limit down. That software is basically the same as their gaming handhelds that they do have. It's really exactly the same because it even shows you the gamepad settings and a setting there for the battery life, which of course this doesn't have because there's no internal battery. Speaking of those internals, very difficult to get access to where the RAM is. I later discovered that it should be upgradable in this model here. There should be two sodium sticks in there, DDR5. And I apologize for when I was looking at it before that I said that it's not upgradable, but it's very difficult to get to. What I do like is this easy access hatch to get to the PCIe 4.0 SSD, which isn't particularly fast there. So the fan noise as mentioned is constant. That's a, a minor, very little con, small con there. The ports on it, port selection. So the two USB type A's on there, I would have liked to have seen at least another two. And we do have the two USB two ports, USB four, sorry. But we have to give one up to power the device if you're not using some sort of uh, dock that would allow you to bypass that and still have the power delivery. So at the 60 watts, the performance was boosted up a little bit, but it really wasn't the best that I've seen out of this particular chipset from Media Lake. I have seen better, and I learned that with the gaming performance and the test that I did run, that the clocks weren't always the highest. They tended to bounce around a little bit, so there was some definite throttling happening, and when pushed hard, I saw 103 degrees Celsius. All up, this is a very nice compact portable Lightweight mini PC, great for traveling, that you can power with a power delivery power supply of at least 65 watts. 100 watts would be, of course, recommended is what they have. But it isn't entirely perfect, this unit here. So if you want the portability, you want some very good power for the size, it has it. But if you want the absolute best in gaming performance, perhaps maybe wait for Lunar Lake mini PCs when they do come out later on, because the timing of this been a Media Lake device, and now we're about to have the release of Lunar Lake isn't exactly brilliant there. So thanks a lot for watching my review here of the One X Player M1 Mini PC.